What does it mean to be the true vine? That's what we're going to find out today in John 15. Boy, we had a big kickoff to our week when learning about these upper room chapters of the Bible. Jesus is giving teachings to his people right before he's about to leave, and he wants them to fully understand everything means because we are going to have to continue on with the Holy Spirit and have this church, have this community of disciples and be here together with each other. Jesus kicks off by saying he is the true vine and his father is the vine dresser, which means gardener. He's the guy who prunes and cares for, does all the things. Every branch that doesn't bear fruit is taken away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. And you say, wait a minute, it is bearing fruit. Why do you prune that? You know what? You prune a fruit tree or any tree. I just got done the other day pruning the tree out that's in my front yard because it was struggling. And so one of the ways you can get it to grow is by pruning it. And it says right here so that you can bear more fruit. If you get pruned, and we no one wants to be pruned, but when you get pruned, you're going to bear even more fruit than you were bearing before. Just this whole part of the vine is that you can't just cut a a branch off of a tree. Like those trees that I cut, their branches are lying dead on the ground. I'm going to put them in a bin for my backyard fire. They're no more connected to the tree. They're no more connected to the vine. They're useless at that point. They have no purpose left. Stay connected. Stay part of the vine. And if you do, you're going to bear fruit. You're going to be a part of this. And even so, we heard other analogies in the Synoptic Gospels about vines that choke out the fruit, choke out the good message. Don't be one of those vines because there's so many things that are out there. The seed that falls into the bramble and just gets strangled by these evil vines, right? Don't be a part of that. But instead, we stay connected so that we can stay into that fruit of God and be a part of it. And when pruning comes, it's cleaned up, it's cut back, right? It looks terrible because pruning is, like I said, one of those things you do to tree to make it healthier. Talking about cleansing and pruning, it means that we're going to have these purifications that come our way. I don't think it all the time feels great, but it means we're going to come out of it with more fruit than ever. He goes on to say, then abide in me, I'll abide in you. Abide means live with, continue with, keep going with. The branches can't fruit by themselves. So unless you abide with the vine, you have to. I'm the vine, you're the branches, you abide in me, I'll abide you. Repeats this many times, but he wants you to get this idea to bear fruit, to be a part of this great thing that's going to happen. Remember, we had all the figs And the figs were either producing fruit or not producing fruit. You want to be a part of this. Abide with Jesus and stay a part of the vine. And if you don't, you're going to wither. Just like the trees in my driveway that I chopped down. All those branches, they're, they're ready for the firewood pile because they don't have life anymore and they don't produce fruit. He says his father has glorified so that you do bear fruit. As my father has loved me, I have loved you. Abide in my love, continue in my love, keep my commandments, and you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments. Jesus is a servant to the Father, just like we should be the servant of God. God the Father loves him. He loves the Father. He loves us. We should love God and the Father. He says so that he says, quote, that my joy may be in you, and that you may have joy, and your joy may be full. We are not in this world for our own pleasures, but if we do the will of God and we stay in the love and we continue in it and we continue in his fire and we don't get to be branches thrown into the fire like my fire pit would, it's not going to be a burden to us. People, I think, think of it like, I don't want to serve God. I don't want to follow God because I want to have fun. I want to enjoy myself. I want to do the things I want to do. Instead, he's saying the exact opposite. You will have joy if you stick with me. And he's not going to call them servants because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I I told you everything my father said. You didn't choose me. I chose you. And you're going to go bear fruit. Gosh, I mean, can you imagine? 
to have the Savior of the world call you friend? He calls us friend too. These things I command to you so that you'll love one another. Again, we want to be in that place where we love each other and continues on. The world hates you. It doesn't hate me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. You know, we see that. If you fall into the things of this world, you're praised, you're celebrated. I mean, how many times? And I think that's, to me, the part that I find the most traumatic, I guess, of anything, is when you see people who are clearly going against the word of God, doing evil to each other, they get celebrated. They get cheered on. And he's saying, you're not in this world. They hate you for it because they hate me for it. Because you're not in this world, they reject you too. And because a servant's not greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. I do all this because they don't know God the Father who sent me. And all these people who are about to put Jesus to death would claim that they worship the Father. They don't. Because if they did, they would accept what I have to say. And, and they wouldn't have been guilty if they did follow. But now they have no excuse for their sin. They got to see me. They got to hear my words. They got the full blast. I mean, it's not even like all of us. We read the word of God, or maybe there's a good number of people who reject reading the word of God. These people are right there and they saw it all live. And they hate me. They hate my father. If he didn't do all these works that no one else could do, they would not be guilty of the sin. But now they've seen it all. They had a front row seat to it and they still rejected me, which is rejecting my father which is rejecting the written law, which should be fulfilled. Wow. And so the helper who comes, whom I'm going to send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, proceeds from the Father, and he'll bear witness. He will, someone said, the thing he loves to do most is talk about Jesus. And so he's going to talk about Jesus. It's his favorite topic, and he's going to do it so that we can bear witness to all the things that we have seen from the very beginning, not just these apostles, but us too. We are meant to carry that tradition on, to bear witness, to have the Holy Spirit with us. I think the interesting thing about bearing witness is to be a witness isn't about, I think we feel failed as evangelists at times. We don't feel good enough, or we don't think we have the right words, or we don't know what to say. But when you bear witness, the only thing you're talking about is what you have seen, what you have, what you know. You don't have to be Paul. You don't have to be, think of whatever famous pastor you've ever heard of. You have to be you and you are bearing witness what you have. Well, I hope that gives you <laughs> some hope in all of this. And that ends chapter 15. What I'm going to meditate on is that whole idea of the world hating us and rejecting everything that Jesus said, which also means they reject the Father, and the fact that they take glory in doing so. Any time that they can reject God, which is true. I mean, how many times, and, and you know, not to call out anything in particular, but we've seen things in modern world that laughs at Jesus, laughs at the Bible, laughs at the church, laughs at everything that God has called us to do because they're outright rejecting him. And again, if we didn't have scripture, we didn't have the word of God, if we didn't know what it is we were supposed to be doing or thinking or saying, I think we'd be out of that guilt. But because it's apparent and everybody knows it, you know, boy, there's a big thing to meditate on. What I'm going to pray about is this concept of Holy Spirit, that I understand the voice of the Holy Spirit better. I think that I've always been somewhat afraid of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to say afraid of the Holy Spirit. I don't have a clear vision of a comforter, a counselor, a helper. And perhaps when I think of God as the Father, which I get a lot from my Judaism, and I think of God in Jesus as the Messiah, which I get from now being a Christian, the Holy Spirit gets left out a bit. I'm going to pray to have a better understanding of that voice of the Spirit of Truth. And what I'm going to share with others is the fact that we're not persecuted because of us. We're persecuted because people hate the Father, they hate the Son, and they hate the laws and the words he speaks and the path they're supposed to take. Not to take it personally when I see the ways of the world 
the servant is never greater than the master, and they hate him long before they hated us as followers and disciples of God. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. We're going to talk next time about chapter 16. Chapter 16 continues on this message that's going to be in this upper room. You know, Jesus told them before to like go get their stuff. We're about to go. This must have been a day I I just can't even imagine because uh, 16 and 17 will continue in this room. But these messages were there, those last messages, so that they could um, continue on and not be orphans. All right. Have a great day.